Hi everyone! Welcome back to another episode of Apply Club Events, hosted by IASA's Applied Anthropology Network. Today we have the pleasure of listening to Anders Munk, Associate Professor and Director of the Technoanthropology Lab at Aalborg University, with the topic Thick Machines, Data Science and Machine Learning in Ethnography. We hope you're going to enjoy this episode, and please don't forget to follow us on our diverse channels like Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Slack, and more, which you can find in the show notes. So I guess we can start right now. So again, good morning, good evening, or good afternoon from where you're based, depending on where you're based, of course. Today, it's a pretty exciting evening for me. 7 p.m. here, CST, to announce that it's going to be the very first event hosted by AC Digi, and that for us is pretty momentous. We have no one but um, Anders Monk currently. I will give you an introduction shortly um, before we start the presentation. Um, I really hope you're all doing fine. There is uh, just one disclaimer I want to point out to you is that this video is going to be recorded. So if anyone of or this event is going to be recorded, so if anyone of you does not want to be included or wants to be um, left out, just drop us a message. We can edit you out. It can also happen after the event, of course. So let me allow me to introduce to you um, Anders Monk. Anders Christian Monk is an associate professor in techno-anthropology and director of the techno-anthropology lab at the University of Oborg in Copenhagen. He holds degrees in ethnology and human geography with a PhD from the University of Oxford and has previously worked with the Sciences Po Media Lab in Paris and the Danish Technical University. Anna's research focuses on controversies about new science and technology as they play out online. To that end, he has been engaged with the integration of data science and machine learning methods into the ethnographic toolkit for the past 15 years. He is a co-author of Controversy Mapping Field Guide, the link of that book I'll, I'll also provide in the, in, the, in the chat box, and the first Danish language textbook on digital methods. So I'm first of all going to share the link of that book with you. And after that, I'm going to give the floor to Anders Swing so we can start the presentation. Anders, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to begin by sharing my screen and checking that you can see that. So do you see what I'm doing? You do. Excellent. So first of all, thank you so much for uh, inviting me here. This is my first time at one of these ply clubs, and I am super excited to see the initiative, which, and that's on me, I have not engaged enough with before. So. Um, I'm just really happy to be here uh, with this crowd. And um, I understood these impulse talks as being sort of an occasion to throw a provocative question out there and talk a little bit about it, but then mainly getting uh, your feedback uh, on what to do about that question. So I'm looking forward to getting that. And, um, and it's in that spirit that I've prepared what I'm, I'm gonna say in a minute. So the talk here is called uh, Thick Machines and the subtitle is Data Science and Machine Learning in Anography. Uh, it's, it's sort of mainly based on a, a paper then that uh, me and some colleagues uh, put out in a special issue of Big Data and Society half a year ago. Um, and that special issue is called Machine Anthropology. Um, it brings together various uh, perspectives on what it might mean to do anthropology with machine learning. Uh, so this is not uh, sort of, you know, uh, studying people who do machine learning with ethnographic methods or combining ethnography <clears throat> and machine learning, but actually trying to integrate uh, data science and machine learning in the ethnographic methods uh, catalog. Now, of course, that, that special issue is not the only place where such things have taken place. I think increasingly in, in industry, you see those integrations happening. Um, Steve Kern was wrote a paper almost 10 years ago, uh, suggesting this might be an, an interesting uh, path forward. 
but um, we did a paper for this special issue where we tried to build uh, a machine, I, f knowing full well that this would not be uh, a, an immediate success, but as an experiment, thinking through what would it mean to build a neural network that at least partly assisted in the process of doing thick description, hence the word thick machines. And I'm, I'm going to work my way uh, towards that paper, uh, starting sort of a little bit out and giving you a little bit of the background. And then the question that I'm going to pose to you in the end is, what does it mean or how do we have ethnographic conversations with an algorithm understood here as, as a machine learning algorithm? And, and the first I would like to start by just outlining, and this may be very familiar to you, but if it's not, I think it's useful to just set the scene. Like why, why might ethnographers and anthropologists have some uh, antipathies, uh, some historical reason for why we do have some antipathies typically towards integrating uh, data science in the ethnographic toolkit and hence maybe preventing us from fully unfolding this question. So I just wanna get some of these antipathies out there in the open so I can dissect them. And, and the first one I've called called bastard algebra, uh, which is, is, is a phrase I've, I've nicked from uh, Nick Siva. Um, and he took it from Melinowski. Uh, and um, what is maybe forgotten today is that already in the, the 1920s and the 1930s, um, you started to see anthropologists who were trying to put kinship systems on mathematical form. Um, so the the quote here, you the quote you see on the on the left here is from from Nick Siva's uh, paper on that, and it's about how Malinowski received that, right? So um, you can see if you want the the image on the right here is is from a later paper in the sixties, but it, it is. Uh, an attempt by an anthropologist, uh, J.P. Boyd, to to represent uh, kinship uh, systems in algebraic form, um, and um, Malinowski is very skeptical towards that. Right, so he he's, he compare he, he does a comparison between kinship, which is essentially about blood, right? It's a I mean it's 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 a very corporeal thing, and then the algebraic representation which is about ink right so Malinowski here says that it you know um the kinship studies would resemble a work of mathematics which um in which the results will be expressed uh, by symbols in some cases even in the form of equations and i must frankly confess that there is not a single account of kinship in which i do not find myself puzzled by some by uh, by some of this spuriously scientific and stilted mathematization of kinship facts, right? Where this is 1930s, uh, a 1930s academic takedown, but it's pretty scathing, right? And of course, um, this is at, in 1930s, this is the already great Malinowski arguing why you should not attempt to formalize kinship systems um, uh, in, in mathematical terms and rather provide the full bodied account. Um, based on, of course, participant observation and ethnographic fieldwork. And I think that's one of the first probably historical inflection points is also coincides with the split into the qualitative and the quantitative sciences, which had not been that separate before. Um, that's probably the first, if not the first, and one of the first occasions where in anthropology we start to see authoritative figures uh, make a very clear distinction between either going in the quantitative direction of formalizing things like kinship or staying with the true ethnographic representation of, of kinship. And it, it happens again in the 1960s, 1970s. So in the 60s, you have the ethnoscientists um, who are um, pursuing a, a version of, of anthropology it's also sometimes called cognitive anthropology, where um, the objective is to, to, to figure out what the rules that allows you to pass for a native in a specific context is. So Carl Frake, for example, wrote a famous paper on, on how to ask for a drink in Subanun, 
and this is his uh, his instructions, the rules on the left, you see. Um, when Clifford Geertz uh, wrote his famous piece about fake description in 73, he took aim at this exact kind of anthropological science and said, you know, um, what I want is a an anthropology that is not trying to discover these, what he calls ethnographic uh, algorithms. Um, so he, it, this is, thick description is the, the paper where uh, Clifford Geertz says that, you know, anthropology is an interpretive science in search, in search of meaning and not an explanatory science in search of law, right? So he, he says that basically ethnography is hermeneutic and not a nomothetic science. Um, and um, he justifies that by using the ethnoscientists and their cultural algorithms as the uh, counterexample, what we should not do. Right? So yet another, another inflection point in ethnographic history, where there's a, a sharp line is drawn between computational analysis of culture and true ethnographic interpretation of culture. All right, so it's it's almost as if now that we're um, in the middle of a of a new uh, machine learning revolution, it's as if 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 there's going to be such a thing as computational anthropology, we're forced with a choice if we stay with this old division, that we either sort of keep on computing, and you see tendencies towards that. So you have people who are reviving. Uh, these 60s ideas that we could have structuralist computing. It was also very big with uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss, for example. So the Heim's big, big volume on computing in, in anthropology uh, from 62 um, is about trying to use uh, the power of computing uh, uh, to realize some of the structuralist dreams. And you see that taken up uh, now also in this special issue on machine anthropology. Um, so people are reviving some of the, the structuralist ideas. Um, and that, that of course, is, uh, is a pretty pure version of what computing should be in anthropology. Like so, so this is a version of computational anthropology where the objective is decidedly not to do a thick description or provide the in-depth particularist account of a specific setting. It is the objective here is to discover the universal patterns, the laws, right? So that's one that's one option if we stay with this old divide we just we jump into the computational camp another option is uh to complement computing as i would call it this is what for example trisha wang suggests in, in her now very cited blog post from 2013 big data needs uh, thick data right that the idea here is that big data is good at certain things but but it needs Big data to make sense, and hence anthropology has a new role, which is using the tried and tested tools of ethnographies to provide the the context uh, that allows of, us to make sense of the patterns that big data provides. So, as here, you could say that thick dis description is still the objective, but is now in the service of completing the picture that is left by big data analysis. Right? I'm, and it's not just me; it's a I think there are many others who are pretty unsatisfied with that choice because it's it seems like a choice that's been forced upon us all the way back to the 30s when and Malinowski's critique of, of algebraic kinship systems. Um, that you're either uh, with thick ethnography or with big data computing. Uh, so I would like to pose this question in a different way, trying to move beyond the conventional divides, if you will. So how can we do that? And I, I, I'm going to suggest two or three ways uh, to do that. Um, and the first one <clears throat> is is based on a, a some some work we did uh, almost ten years ago now, uh, where we revisited some of the atlas projects that were prominent both in anthropology and ethnology and folkloristics in the early twentieth century. So the atlas projects were about tracing. Uh, uh, cultural patterns uh, across the globe or across Europe. If it was there was a big European Atlas project, this is the one you're seeing here. So you looked at uh, all sorts of cultural elements, like how do you build your houses? What kind of songs do you sing to your kids at night? 
how do you celebrate the solstice? Um, what kind of implements do you use to plow your field? Right, so uh, huge uh, questionnaires, uh, and then you would plot these cultural variations on maps, and um, you would see what kind of patterns emerged. Now, these projects uh, in in anthropology have something like the standard cross cultural sample. These projects have been critiqued often as being sort of early quantitativist predecessors that would enable the kind of computational anthropology I talked about before. But actually, when you look at what happened to many of the ethnographers that were doing these atlas projects, is that they they discovered strange anomalies in the patents. This was typically ethnographers that were working before you had the Jochemian influence of believing that you know the the organic analogy uh, influence in the con concept of culture everywhere. So you know, is, except outside of the UK, so. These ethnographers did not necessarily have an idea that there was one Danish culture and one Norwegian culture and one Swedish culture and all had to make sense inside those organic holes. But, you know, they perceived culture as being something that was composed, as Gabriel Tart would say, mon monadologically composed out of the elements. And so they looked at these traces, these patterns, and that generated questions for them, like, why is it that we normally see this pattern around hay rakes, but in this particular region of Sweden, it seems to be a different uh, pattern, right? And that led them to into doing community studies. So basically going to visit these areas, embedding with the people who live there and trying to provide thick accounts of the pattern anomalies they discovered through quantitative mapping. And I think we can do similar stuff today, just with much more available and easily available data on the internet um, and uh, with the ability to discover patents uh, automatically or machinically. So this is uh, an example here of a, of a project I did uh, in, in 2012, trying to trace the development of the new Nordic uh, food, the new Nordic food movement or the new Nordic cuisine across Scandinavia. The space you're seeing represented here on the right is a, is a network space of websites that are linking to each other. And um, I've used uh, a community detection algorithm to, to tell me, you know, what are the, what are the strong patterns of, of websites that tend to always associate with each other in this corpora of, of 2000 uh, gastronomically related websites in Scandinavia. And you, there, there are some very unsurprising things. For example, that you know, Swedish websites, gastronomic websites, always tend to link to each other, and Norwegians do as well, Danes do as well. But then you have some types of websites. For example, up here, mushroom pickers, and and they just link to other mushroom pickers. They don't link to websites from their own country or from their own local area, and that's the same thing for um, herb pickers or for people who make uh, schnapps or for people who brew beer um, they have communities of practice rather than national communities and on top of that you can then overlay lay things like you know where do you then find a lot of talk about things like locally produced you can get you know you can get interested in the fact that well these beer brewers they have zero interest in in stuff that is locally produced uh, and they are very different from uh, the, the Swedish beer brewers down here are very different from the rest of the Swedish gastronomic actors. And I use that, I use those kind of maps to lead me on to do ethnographic field work. And I think that this kind of computing is, is actually helping you develop even more particular accounts of local situations, because it allows you to be even more bottom up. It allows you to get rid of uh, more if I had not had these algorithms at my disposal, then I would have had to sort of probably import some ideas about what are the modes of association that these actors have uh, to just try and make sense of my field. But in this case, I could actually start with the traces themselves and, and from that spot patterns. So I think there is a way in which um, this kind of granular data and the ability to treat it uh, with various forms of machine learning can also help you build even more particular accounts of a specific phenomenon. 
I could, we could call it particularist computing, as I've done here, or you could call it maybe ideographic computing as opposed to nomothetic computing. So that's a, a, a form of computing that is decidedly not uh, aimed at discovering general laws or rules of culture. It's aimed as, at crafting uh, a complex account of a specific situated phenomenon. All right, so that was the first way in which I think we can have a different um, approach that is not so burdened by the old divides. But maybe there is, um, and this is where I'm getting to the thick machine paper. There is another version where we um, exploit the fact that um, the current generation of machine learning algorithms, as opposed to the ones they had in the 60s, are actually very bad at producing rules. So what they when, when we talk about learning today, we typically assess it by saying, so you train your algorithm in some context, being a data set, and then you evaluate how good it has become at uh, predicting known results in the same data set. But uh, neural networks and techniques like deep learning do not actually produce uh, discernible rules. They don't tell you how they reach their conclusions. This is contrary to the kind of rule-based machine learning they had in the 60s. So there is absolutely no way that the current generation of machine learning is going to uh, fulfill the ethno-scientist ambition that we would discover the rules because we don't know the rules <laughs> that a neural network come up with, right? Uh, this is the whole debate in explainable AI. Uh, there is there is a way in which neural networks and deep learning is fundamentally unexplainable, right? They don't don't write out the rules to us, and 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 if 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 we ask them to, they would probably write out rules that were way too complex to be comprehended by humans because they work on on way more dimensions than we're able to to logically grasp, right? So, in that sense, you could say, and I'm not the only one who who has argued that that the current generation of machine learning algorithms are probably more akin to the way an, an ethnographer would function in the field, right? We also have these moments when things begin to make sense and we, we feel that we've now attuned to the way, you know, the native way of making sense. Uh, but we could not write out exactly what are the, you know, the logical rules in our brains that allow us to do that. We can say, well, you know, we've become pretty good at it and we can try and do things like you know, post hoc interpretability of that, but but we can't, it's not a set of rules we can write out. So maybe the current generation of machine learners actually are more reminiscent of a human ethnographer in, you know, immersing themselves in a particular setting and at some point beginning to make sense of it. And that we exploit, we explored that idea in um, this paper uh, called The Fake Machine. Uh, we tried to train using a very big Facebook data set. We tried to train uh, a neural network to guess uh, emoji reactions of people commenting on other people's Facebook posts. So the data set contains text that is a post, and then some user comments on that text with another piece of text. And they also react to the post with an emoji reaction. Could be like a wow or an angry face or a love or a ha ha, um, and so this allows us to train the machine to say, well, if I see this kind of text used on that kind of text, I have to associate it with this kind of emoji reaction. And once trained, that machine can make predictions. It can read common text and try to predict the emoji reaction. And so we built an arcade game where the machine does that and it plays against humans who are trying to do it as well. And this is how it looks here, are a couple of my colleagues, you can see it's, it's actually built as an arcade game. Uh, here are a couple of my colleagues, uh, they have to guess, you can see there are, there are five emoji buttons for each of them, it's a two player game. They have to guess um, uh, against the computer. So here the post is, uh, it's, about, um, it's about the now late uh, uh, husband of the Danish queen who did not want to be uh, uh, married, uh, sorry, no, buried <laughs> next to his wife because he was mad about not being treated uh, properly. 
And so a user here comments, I will gladly swap problems with him. Happy to refrain from a royal title in exchange for 8 million kroner a year, or just the 29 million uh, for the sarcophagus. Then he can fight my effing ex and the system without getting as much as a penny from me in return. Get a real problem, King Carrot. Right, so here the, the machine is predicting that this user is angry. He's using an angry face. Um, and I think the human players predicted angry as well, but the actual reaction is, is a laughing smiley. Now, of course, this, there's irony here. Like you, you use that laughing smiley, but it's just a kind of a, an ironic laughter. So that situation is imbued with several layers of meaning, which is why the, the machine can't immediately predict it. Uh, and sure enough, when we compare, it turns out that the, the humans and the machine are, are equally bad. They have the same accuracy, and they also they also have the same pattern of accuracy. Right? They're, 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 they're wrong and right in the same situations. So there are some situations that are more difficult, both for the machine and the humans, and some that are easier. And our argument here is that, well, how should we think about that? We should probably not think about it as, okay, so the machine is shit at actually predicting because so are the humans. And in ethnographic terms, this would mean that when you're, when you don't get a situation immediately, I think the ethnographic instinct would be, well, that means something is puzzling. There are more layers of meaning that makes it not immediately interpretable. And hence this situation is probably ripe for thick description. There is something here to actually interpret. And our suggestion in this paper is that this is how we might work with these kind of algorithms. We should not expect them to be precise or explainable. We should try and train them to be puzzled in the same way that we're puzzled and then exploit that puzzlement to guide us towards the rich situations that can actually be interpreted. So the question here is, you know, you could, you could say if machine learning is, is not uh, an explanatory science that allows us to extract laws the same way they thought in the 60s, well, can it be an interpretive one in search of meaning, paraphrasing phrasing, uh, Clifford Geertz? And, and if that's the case, how, how should we talk to our machines? And, and what should we expect them to tell us? And, and this is kind of what I would like to discuss with you. And I just want to show you something that I'm doing at the moment. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying at the moment, I'm playing around with how to have ethnographic conversations with algorithms that have already been trained. So this is the, the, uh, the GPT-2 uh, uh, text uh, algorithm. Uh, and I'm, you can see, I'm the one saying, can you describe a typical day to me? And here you see the, the algorithm is trying to complete my sentences based on what it's been trained to do. So I'm, I'm curious, is there a way that in which, even though I don't, no one can actually explain how GPT-2 reaches its conclusions about how to complete your sentences. Is there a way in which we can kind of debrief that algorithm based on the way it's now learned to talk? And probably we shouldn't be asking it questions like this. Maybe we should, you know, try to begin its sentences by saying my day usually begins and then <laughs> see what it, what it comes up with does that is that a way in which could we consider this algorithm as having been on field work in the data set it's working on and 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 if so then probably we as anthropologists have a lot to tell uh, to data science and machine learning about how to debrief these algorithms rather than expecting them to be perfectly explainable and accurate as the gold standard explainable and accurate is something that ethnographers have never been, and yet we've developed a way of thinking about and talking about the results of ethnography that is pretty useful. And I would suggest that we have something here to teach machine learning, which is why I'm asking you this question. I'm going to stop there. Okay, well, Mark, um, Anders, that was really impressive. And I think many of you probably see some parallels with the recent news we got from Google of Lambda being identified as a sentient being. But for now, I'm going to leave the answers to you and, and all the associations in the breakout groups, which are going to take about 10 minutes. And after we um, go, and there's going to be about four to five, you'll be divided into four to five groups. 
And after that, after those 10, 10 minutes, there's going to be a plenary session in, um, in the room where we are currently at. And after the plenary session, we can have a Q&A so you can ask any question that is currently burning on your lips. So I will start a division currently. If I uh, break out groups. And let's move to the first one for a summary of the plan of the discussion. Who's going to start first group? I think that was the one with uh, Janice, if I'm correct. Wow. Uh, Janice, we can't hear you. We uh... pressured Peter into giving our feedback. OK, Peter, then I'm giving the floor to you. Sorry, I was for some reason I was thinking we were group two, but anyway, um, yeah, happy to 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 do this. Uh, we had a really short but intense discussion. Uh, um, I, you know, I think one of the things that sort of one of the takeaways we had was, you know, the 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 sort of the um, the invitation to to consider how we might engage the machine as a participant in in the. In our in our studies, and so one of the follow up questions from that was: so, what kind of skills do we need, or what kind of mediators or interpreters do we need to do that? I mean, can, can we expect just to you know um, engage the machine as a participant without any prior knowledge, or do we need to be computer experts, or you know? So, I guess sort of what are the what are the skills or tools that we could use to begin to to do that. Um, another question was around reflexivity and, and, and method, I suppose, broadly speaking, you know, using the example of the, um, uh, I think the phrase was um, particularist computing, um, using that example. So how around bias and, and um, you know, we could also refer to things like gender bias or, um, things like that that are also sort of programmed into a lot of the you know we've seen how like Facebook and things you know, racial biases and things could be um, programmed into the machine. So how how can we become more reflexive around the use of of this this uh, sort of additional source or uh, participation? Um, because I think like for that that example like um, you know around. Um, around food, um, super great uh, inspiration for, for further field work, but you know, to what extent is that biasing our inquiry then at that point once you have that, that information? So those are a couple, couple points we had, probably missing a lot of other things. So hopefully the others can fill in. <laughs> Can I can I ask back or or, or how, how does this normally work? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Anders. Because these are great questions, and I just I want to answer with other questions. So, you know, this question about bias aren't aren't we supposed to be the ones who are sort of the experts at handling cultural? I mean, essentially, the biases that are programmed into these things are. I think they're cultural biases, right? It's like they're trained on on data sets that are basically cultural culturally biased. Um, so we're isn't that doesn't that call for an anthropologist rather than sort of I'm not sure should should the anthropologist stance to that not be like, okay, this is something for us to explore rather than we need to fix that before we can use it. Um, yes, that's true, but at least we more or less know how our bias operate. With the questions we ask to the machine, we may not necessarily know the type of bias that would be creating like let's say in in those kind of conventional examples of uh, um, job applications and the best candidates happen to be a harvard 
um, um, uh, graduates, white men who play curling or what, whatever, kind of the, those things, right? So these are in Kat, Catherine D'Ignazio's uh, uh, th those gender uh, AI um, critical minded reflections. And obviously those people wouldn't want to get such a skewed picture. They wouldn't want all the good candidates to come up as the white Harvard man, right? And how would we know uh, how to frame questions to avoid the biases, um, like even at that kind of a very obvious level, uh, and deeper levels, of course, are more problematic, of course. You're muted. Uh... Yeah, sorry. I think there is, so the, there is a difference, obviously, between people using machine learning for all sorts of purposes, some more horrible than others. Uh, and then, and, and you know, thinking about how they could be integrated in ethnographic practice, but still, I think that, in, you know, I, the idea that we can have unbiased questions or like that there, you know, we, we, we know, right, that, that there is no such thing as an, as an unbiased anything, right? <laughs> There's always, these perspectives are always situational. So I think the, the relevant question here is, is what kind of, this comes back maybe to your point about what kind of skills do we need? Like, how would we interrogate that? Like, so uh, in, in the example with the GPT-2 model, I think if you were to, to debrief that model, then you, you do need to, to know quite a lot about how that kind of, uh, that's also actually a neural network, how that kind of neural network is trained in order to try and, and have any kind of sensible debriefing with it. Um, but again, I'm not sure how much that differs from, because what I'm talking about is not our own biases. We, yeah, we have methods for handling that, but, but we also know that, you know, when we go on field work, people we hang out with have very ethnocentric perspectives on the world. And, and sometimes it can be quite hard work to work your way into to that. And I'm, I kind of think that it's the same here, right? Is that, you know, there are, of course, there are things or skills you need to learn and um, ethno terms you need to, to acquire in order to, to interrogate the machine. But it's, in principle, I don't think that different from hanging out with anyone who has a, a radical different worldview than your own. Mm. I, I see what you mean, the same kind of same struggle, there is just another actor. But I think, or, sorry, if I just, I'll, I'll, I'll finish after this, but I just, there's one follow up there. Um, I guess, you know, part of the challenge is the audience. So the audience may, uh, depending on what audience you're talking to, the audience may sort of give more authority to sort of machine learned insights versus insights collected by an ethnographer. So it's also about the power behind those things. And um, so I guess, you know, that's also part of the issue. Um, so it's maybe not this, I wouldn't necessarily call it sort of apples and apples. I think it's apples and oranges, but the question is, you know, maybe it's a question of size or color or something like this. I don't know um, uh, if you get my point. So, I mean, I'm just thinking like, how do we, you know, we, I think with the, with the A&T kind of approach and sort of, the, you know, thinking beyond the human is it for me an, an opportunity to, to think beyond sort of human biases and think how things are more contextualized. And so taking that sort of lesson and, and like, maybe how would you how would you suggest we sort of because I think the risk is you know you're getting to this again sort of dualistic kind of 
sort of qual quant or or machine human kind of thing where you kind of lose the third element or the context and so i'm just wondering like for your own in your own eyes um anders what what sort of perspectives or 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 sensitivities would you propose that we use to kind of you know balance the playing field a little bit more even though we'll never be on be able to get beyond our own personal biases or any bias for that matter yeah all right so leaving aside the and of course i'm very there's a lot of ant in my world uh, normally but but in, I, I sort of leave that for the second half of the i just yeah push that aside just for a second and just so i i i think the what i would like to do here is to say, and this is this speaks to your point about power, which is we have this expectation that that somehow um, because it's machine learned, it has to be um, more accurate, and it has to be more explainable, and it has to be more sciency and more quantitative. And I think you know, which is somewhat understandable, but sort of weird if it comes from us because like why would we want to reproduce that idea? idea like, it's like maybe we have you know you could also you could also look at the whole explainable ai debate and say like you know you've been approaching it all wrong like these ethnographers of anyone knows that these machines are never going to become you know totally accurate it's always going to be layers upon layers of meaning and then it's layers of meaning all the way down there's and and there's no way in which you're going to extract a rule set from this algorithm that tells you exactly how to make sense in this particular situation, right? So it's always going to be a conversation where you have, you know, post hoc interpretability. Like you, you know, you sit with whatever is the, you try to debrief the algorithm, basically. And I think we we have the tools. Like I think there 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 is a lot of, for once, it's not about um, an innovation happening somewhere else, and now anthropology has to catch up and sort of and integrate. But it's more like saying. Oh, you know, you've reached a point in in machine learning where actually you're running into problems that we've been dealing with for a hundred years. <laughs> so I think I think we should think about what it is in our uh, methods tradition that we have to offer to to machine learning right now. And I think we this is about moving the conversation away from things like um, bias and explainability and accuracy and towards things like um deep layers of meaning explications rather than explanations constructing readings upon readings of texts and yeah representational issues things like that uh, i don't know if that's a very good answer but that, i don't know if, it, if i have a better answer that's that's my hunch that this is what we can we really have a moment now where we can offer something into that field rather than just thinking about you know how stuff other people do is we should also do um in terms of Ilona AMP, yeah. hit, uh, yeah, sorry, Ilona no, hit, uh, ra raised the hand, but yeah. just a very, very little uh, comment. I'm from that generation of university professors where one, one sees that if you have the presentation for the students on a PowerPoint, they feel that that's more uh, valid uh, than what you write on, on the on the blackboard or, or, or whatever. Of course, we may be aware of it, but the receiver uh, may not approach the uh, outcomes as wisely as we do. Yeah, that, that has very obvious parallels to, you know, spinning a nice data visualization or <laughs> some uh, confusion matrix in the background while you say things, right? That's, that's also the case the case now. So I think um, we had one raised hand from Silvana. I'm giving you the floor and later on I'm going to move to the other breakout group. So oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> no, no, please. Um, go ahead. Mm. So uh, um, what I was thinking was um, when you think about a traditional uh, ethnographic field, we also do preparations before. Right, so we don't go there without knowing anything. So when we talk about um, the ethnographic field in this part, I would say that this is where we are talking 
to the machine. So we are making the questions to the machine. So there needs to be a preparation before that. And what I would like to ask is, do you consider that this preparation should be understanding the data set that was used or what preparation it is before we do this, before we have this interaction with the machine? Yeah, I think that, that depends because I think in the in my example with particular risk computing, I, I think it's it's about actually constructing the data set as you go. Uh, and in the last example I used with the GPT, it's it's you take something that's been trained on something that you don't actually know. It's sort of the extreme case of we don't know the data set. Uh, we can't uh, ask the algorithm how it works. We're just presenting with the results. So can we can we do can we have an ethnographic conversation with it to learn something about about it? Um, and I think there is in if if it's the latter case, as I said before, I think there is. Uh, part of the preparatory work here inevitably has to involve understanding something about how an algorithm like that at least is trained like we, we can't we, we're not going to see the data set we're not going to get the exact rules but we have to understand at least what the what is the principles of of how a neural network gets trained um in order to to have a chance of i think making any sense of of the way it, it, it's answering or completing your <laughs> your sentences uh in, in the other in the other instances, um, I think it's much more work in progress. I think it's 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 I think of you know in the in the example with Nordic food, this actually began with me being on field work. I was doing participant observation, and I saw some of my informants. You know, they were foraging and they were logging their finds into a web database, and and I wanted to follow that work. And then rather than me doing that manually, I I programmed a crawler to follow where they were putting their finds of stuff to, to eat in nature and who were interacting with that and, and what were they finding and that led me to more field work. So I think there there it's the, the kind of it, it's more a question of of saying like um, if you know to if if you can script things like that in Python, then you have a a a, a, a tool set that allows you to to craft even more situated accounts, or it gives you more opportunities for crafting situated accounts as you go. And it's not so much about foreshadowing. It's, it's about, you know, grabbing the leads, thinking on your feet as, as you go on field work. Okay, many thanks for um, the, ex the, the live discussion already. I'm really taking the energy here. So we're moving on to the next group. And I think um, Dominica, Rodrigo, and Marcus were part of that one. If I'm missing anyone, I'm, I'm sorry. The groups got a little scrambled up. But who of, of um, the three of you wants to give a short summary? Marcus, do you want to keep the summary or should I go I don't think Marcos can hear me. All right, so it's uh, it's basically what Marcos posted in the chat. So this was Marcos posted the chat a, a question in in the chat. So our group only initially focused on that we should um, explore how the algorithms are uh, designed and constructed, how they how they are uh, created as. As uh, Rodrigo and Marcos suggested, they are always people behind algorithms. So we should start the process of understanding uh, of how uh, the algorithms are created. So this is one point we discussed. Second point was that um, it was actually my point. So this is actually my question. So it's um, Anders, when you ask this question, um, how we should speak to the algorithm? Is it that you mean a language communication, perhaps uh, like language wording, or shall we talk to algorithm? Can we talk to algorithms algorithm in a in a different way? So using a different way of communication. So treating them as a different nation in different grammar, the way we speak to people in different uh, language languages. So this is what one one of my ideas is. As we now already speak to algorithms, when I when I'm on Google, I type "people are." There mm. will be an autocomplete. This is my algorithm in Google speaking to me. You will you will get a different conversation 
with a, with a, with, with your algorithm. So it depends on what you de define as a conversation. And I think that the biggest problem with with algorithm is that they are very good in production. So there is a Google algorithm which can write an email for me, and it helps me a lot. It writes entire sentences as they are very predictable, and uh, like they they are good in production. The problem with algorithm algorithms is uh, reception. So they will not understand my intention. So they will not answer. They will not understand what I mean. What what is my intention? Once they know, they can reply. But the, but the problem is understanding, and I think that th this is the biggest biggest problem in conversations with machines. Yeah, so two points about that. So um, I think with your Google example, um, this would be an open question to me. Is it your algorithm or is it an algorithm for a group? I think this is the kind of conversation we could have with it. Like, So I wouldn't presume, even though I, you may be right, that, that my algorithm would be different from yours. But I think this is what we're doing here is having that kind of conversation I'm, I'm asking for because we're doing field work with the algorithm we're trying to figure out is it you know is it, maybe there's a group of people who have a pretty similar google algorithm <laughs> and, and, and other people who have very different google algorithms what what would that tell us about the way the algorithm works i think that's beginning to provide an ethnographic characterization of the google algorithm algorithms yes right um in in terms of the what are the machines good at? I very much agree. And I think the, the point we're trying to make in the thick machine paper is to say that rather than considering this a problem with algorithms, we should maybe recognize that humans tend to be like this as well, unless they make an effort, right? So humans tend to be pretty bad at doing thick descriptions with people there that are sort of out group, right? They tend to, we tend to be horribly ethnocentric and pressing our own interpretations of an, a situation on people who are not part of our, yeah, normal situations. Um, and and this, I think, if it was if humans are doing that, then the ethnographic reaction would be, okay, so there is something to learn here. There's clearly a mismatch between there's you know, someone is providing an an ethnocentric misinterpretation of what's going on. They're not getting your intentions, which means some layers of meaning are lost. We would take that as an occasion to then call in the professionals. Let's have an ethnographer try and make sense of the situation. And I think maybe that's how we should think about using these algorithms. Uh, that kind of machine learning at least is to say okay so machine learning machine learning is pretty good at guessing when situations are shallow like when there's no ambiguity you know nothing is lost between the lines they can be trained to guess that to, to predict what's going on but that also means that uh, algorithmic failure can help us point us to a situation where it's it's hard to know what's going on and you need to do the graphic work to to you know explicate the layers of meaning in that situation so I, that was that was at least the point I was attempting to make is that we can those kind of failures might guide us to the places where we need it rather than thinking that okay that means that machines are stupid well humans are pretty stupid at that sometimes as well that's why that we play on the ambiguity in the thick machine right it's, it's both thick in the sense of being daft it's not very good but but it can point us to play to situations that need thick description. And I kind of think that's what you're also describing, right? That it has a, it fails to understand your intentions. Okay, so someone needs to understand your intentions, and and the failure means that we now know that here's a situation where where that's needed. I'm going to give the floor to Rodrigo. He was raising his hand. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I would like to um, ask if uh, the uh, how good the actor network theory could help us to like uh, 
yeah, under like the algorithm as a essence, as an actant, as they tell, as they say itself, and how it interacts with other, um, yeah, other items in their environment, such as like space or such as like the, the, the language or uh, the, the same context. Uh, I think uh, the actor network theory could be like a, a really helpful tool to uh, understand um, and to communicate with the algorithm algorithm itself. Maybe this was the point you were making as well, Peter, before. Um, I'm, I'm, I didn't actually, so, I mean, clearly there is something about actor network theory and the focus on uh, whatever makes it, like the effects of action, right? Um, we don't talk about an actor and actor network theory unless it, it has a difference in the situation. And so in a sense, you're always describing and gauging actors by the difference they're making to situations. And probably that has a lot of mileage also uh, when we talk about algorithms, like rather than trying to in understand their internal logics, we should describe what kind of effects they're having um, in specific situations, like how they're acting in A and C terms. Um, for, but I think that's about maybe most relevant for when we're studying algorithms. Uh, and, and what I also, what I, I at least also want to do, I, I want to use algorithms to study stuff with. Um, and I think there is another um, actor network theoretical use there, which is uh, if we are, you know, doing an actor network theoretical account is always uh, horribly restrained by the fact that it's super laborious if you're tracing all the associations that are being made all the time and so you know you, you just have to stop at some point and it's pr probably an unsatisfactory point because you ran out of resources and time to trace those associations and and so there is and this is something you've seen being very prominent in the digital methods the last 15 years right there's this dream at least in in, in actor network theory that, that you maybe we we could make use of computers to to speed that up like we, we could at least trace more associations right this is where you see the revival of Gabriel Tart's work and Fula too and, and things like that right that um I, and I in my experience it, it it it's definitely possible to do it sort of on the level of detecting how new alliances form like all of a sudden something seems to gain weight uh, something becomes an authority like if it's in the scientific literature it's we can detect on, on very, very large scales, when is, it, when is it that some specific author or specific discipline suddenly gets cited a lot or whatever, right? So this, this points us to uh, the effect, like something happened, action happened, there was an effect. And again, then we would have to ask, well, how, how is that brought about? And that's probably where the computational methods tend to fail us. Like it will take us to that moment we can identify the point where some new actor emerged, but then we have to do qualitative work from there to, to account for the actual translations or mediations that made it possible for that actor to make that difference. At least that's my experience so far, but yeah. Does that, does that make, uh, make sense? Yeah. yeah, thank you. All right, um, I see a raised hand, but I'm going to move first to the last group, Peter, and then you can ask a question if you like. I, I just had a follow-up question to that, uh, just a clarification. Is that okay if I could just slip it in? Or Yeah, of course, yeah. Okay, so I mean, I just in the conversation here around the use of, of machine and, and, um, and the actor network theory and like questions around perspective, I just was thinking of a, maybe a, a very, um, sort of shorthand um, sort of way to think of differently about how we might see or use the machine. So I've heard it referred to as a kind of, you know, as a participant or actant in a context. So that would be maybe the, the more, um, uh, the more sort of emic kind of perspective, trying to understand 
it from within its context. And then I've also heard it used more as a kind of, you know, a voice of the expert or as an, you know, key informant or something that we might call. So maybe also more, I'm probably confounding these, these perspectives, but maybe a little bit more towards the ethic, ethic side of, of things. And then I also heard it being used as a kind of tool, right, as a kind of um, machine as machine, essentially, uh, uh, as a technology for ethnography. Um, so I'm just curious if, you, you know, does that resonate at all with, because I think it's like some of these, you know, we're, it, because it is a very versatile kind of dynamic entity we're talking about, maybe it's helpful to introduce something like that to the conversation where we can understand a little bit more about from which perspective we're approaching it. Because for me, it's very confusing in general. Yeah, I think I try to to uh, to offer different ways out. For, so for me, it begins with a dilemma, and the dilemma is, um, I want to. Oh, no, let's let let me begin another way. For me, it begins with the desire to escape the idea that you're either if you're doing computation, you're doing very quantitativist, nomothetic. Uh, you know, kind of cultural science along the lines of the ethnoscientist or structuralist computing, right? And if you're, or you're doing uh, particularist, uh, thick ethnography, I don't want to be trapped in that dichotomy. And so for me, that means, it could mean different things. It could mean, well, if you were, if you're in the, if you have the ambition to do to provide a very particularist situated account, maybe these techniques can be used in an ideographic way rather than a nomothetic way, right? Not with any ambition to extract universal laws, but just to provide in an ANT way a more, you know, a better account of the situation. That's one way. That's using the machine as a machine. Um, but we could also think about the fact that machine learners and machine learning algorithms increasingly are remind you more and more of what I think an interpretative ethnography is doing ethnographer is doing in the field rather than you know you can see a move in the machine learning from the first generation which is rule-based you know here are the rules of chess execute them towards um, this machine works like a human brain uh, absorb what's going on in this situation and see if you can reproduce it. I think that this means that possibly these machines are working more and more like an endocrine is trying to work when they're on field work. You know, the train, the situation where a machine is being trained might be reminiscent of what we're doing on field work to some extent. And I think that 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 offers something else. This means we then maybe now we can we can come up with ways to to debrief the machine. Or to talk about and with the machine rather than using it uh, to study something. I think those are two different ways out of the of, of the dilemma. Sorry for making it confusing, but that's uh, it's also partly confusing to my mind. That's where I am right now. So I think it's actually a very good start for a further inquiry. For which we're going to move to um, the last group. I think, Katie, that's you. I think we yeah, we, Silvana and I had, well, I basically peppered her with questions because she's also fascinating. And we just went on a tangent um, around this topic. I think we specifically talked around this idea of machine as tool and sort of really interested in that concept of machine learning similar to interpretive ethnography that kind of was you know, an interesting way to think about this. And I, I, I don't know, Solon, do you want to share some of the thoughts? Because you were saying some really interesting things and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I thought it was fascinating, so. Uh, I, I, I mean, I start talking and then I lose myself. So this is uh, <laughs> to be, I mean, we were talking basically about uh, like, well, more about data scientists and how they, uh, work with this data and then we start talking about a uh, thick description and how can we use thick description as a concept to them explain to them what thick description is and uh what we were talking about was more like can we actually do that because 
when they think about the data that they are receiving, they are considering as neutral and it is a data set. And when you use the word description, it already has included in it something that is being explained, explanatory. So how can we utilize thick description to them? How can we actually explain in a very <laughs> simple way the use that we have for thick description in this field? But here, when I say it is not only machine learning, but to all data science uh, field, machine learning, AI, everything, because we are working with engineers. So that's usually, at least I have that barrier most of the time in the conversations. And it, it of course, it usually goes also to biases and all of that. But to explain our methods and our language <laughs> in a way that it can actually be utilized by them. Not only we sitting there explaining the data. I'm I, now as super confusing. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I think one one way is to say like maybe we should should we work with engineers or should we do this ourselves? I think there is a. I don't know why necessarily. I mean, there is a, there's some barrier to entry, but but as I just wrote to Peter, I mean, I think we we also, you know, if if you go on field work and at least classically, you have to there's a lot of things you have to learn to, to need, need to know how to behave and how to, you know, to speak a language and things like that, right? So there's pretty high barriers to entry to going to field work normally as well. So, the, but but besides that, I think one thing that is useful to think about here is that. I don't think there's one data, I mean, data science is such a hybrid category, right? And so there is like, there is the, there's like the quantitative social scientist who has now just gotten more data, but basically still resides in the same epistemology as they always did. I think they are the most difficult ones to explain the concept of thick description to. Uh, engineers, there are very kinds of engineers, but I, at the other end of the spectrum, I think we should think about the physicists, right? So you have physicists who are, there are a lot of data scientists who come from physics and they've moved into like things like social physics and they have a completely different idea about, you know, they don't work with representative samples of anything, right? They work with emergence, like um, for them, it's completely normal to think that, you know, think about complexity, the fact that, Phenomena are emergent, and then other phenomena are emergent. Like that's that's how that's how they usually model the world. And in my experience, it's much easier to have a kind of an anthropological conversation with that kind of a, of data scientist. So I think there is a there is definitely some work in terms of what are good data science friends and what are bad data science friends. And maybe part of what I'm trying to say is that that we need to move beyond. This, like we should at least not, it's not in our interest to accept this idea that, you know, computation means having quantitativist ambitions. And so, you know, that means you, you don't subscribe to all the classic uh, epistemological commitments of quantitative social science. I think that's that's definitely not the way to go, right? And and what I'm trying to say is that there are there are so many, so many other ways. There's, there's no law of nature saying that this is, this is the only way to use machine learning. And, and the physicists are a good proof of that, a good example of that, I think, yeah. Uh, I don't have a better answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> All good. <laughs> Any other comments from, from your group? Katie, do you wanna? Say no, I think more. I, 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 no, I, mine was just reflecting in commentary. I mean, I just thought it was, it's just really interesting to think about use, using th this machine learning as a separate tool and then sort of conversing with it, kind of just put my brain in a different space. So I'm still whirling with that concept. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm in a situation where I'm always trying to explain this to people that are pretty far away from this field and I struggle sometimes using 
some of, you know, I think specifically right now we're in a conversation where a lot of this is like, how do you explain this to data scientists or people that work with big data versus qualitative scientists? And I, I really do like your perspective saying, well, do we have to do that? <laughs> and can we just think about this as a new space? I think that's very interesting, although I'm not in that situation yet. I think it's a conceptually a very provocative um, idea. I just want to add that that besides because there is something about just being in academia where sometimes you can just allow yourself to not deal too much with those problems. But I want to say that I've uh, the place where I really meet these issues is I, I'm also the co-founder of a spin-off company that does combine anthropology and data science. And of course, you know, in order to have clients, you need to explain this stuff all the time. And this has been the single most challenging part of running that. Like, it's not getting people who can do good anthropology, or getting people who can do data science, or even integrating the two. It's crafting the narrative, like finding a way of talking about this that works on a market. Like, you know, we can actually talk to clients about that. And we're not there yet. I, that's I recognize that's a massive challenge. Yeah. Struggling with the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> I think especially when you have an audience that most of them are engineers or data scientists or then that's because it's almost that you are being checked at the same time. It's like, but can you explain this in a better way? Can you, but how do you explain this? But how should we use it? And and then you're like, but we really don't know 100%, but I'm, can we at least what I try to do is, can we do this together? Can we work with this together? Because you were saying like, but do we have to? Mm. I mean, we don't have to, but at the point that we are now, and now talking more about companies, I kind of feel that we have to, because the place of data scientists and of engineers, it's already there. And uh, we kind of need to go through the doors and say, but maybe we can help you out with this let me help you out with the data set. It's not only inserting data, I can be here next to you and I do understand what you're doing. So I kind of see it more, at least in a company wise, yeah. that we need to do that, do that leveling somehow. Yeah. It's just that my own experiences, I, I, I ran into that uh, and I got really tired of it. And I decided that okay, I'm just gonna have to. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have to learn to do some of the stuff if I'm gonna advance it. Um, but but I totally appreciate that there is a organizational reality in companies that is different. Um, but I'm not sure about like how. It's also about how should we train anthropologists because it, I'm not sure we're doing them a favor by saying you should not learn an anthropological version of this. You should just you know. You're going to have this t-shaped kind of collaboration where you're going to meet you're going to meet a data scientist and what you need are just the skills to collaborate i'm not i'm not quite sure because eventually they're always going to have the power to you know <laughs> they're going to be the ones who control the, the, the machine right so if, if if we don't if we're not capable of rebuilding those machines or interrogating them properly i'm not sure we're ever going to break properly into that but we have the possibility of making questions and sometimes yeah, just the sure. questioning makes the thought change and makes i mean at least is, <laughs> that's how i see it because I, I think that it is also a bit unfair to a certain point to request someone that has already studied anthropology and is involved in anthropology now go and learn computer science just because you know yeah. just so you can do this if you have that in yourself if you want to learn it fantastic but yeah. to actually say that okay for you to understand this and to work with this you have to learn this too yes but maybe it's, i just want to say maybe it's not about learning computer science because i don't think that's when i i don't want people to learn computer science i want them to learn whatever they need to learn as anthropologists and i don't think i don't want to call that computer science but it's like you're on field work and here is something that you would like to trace. And it so happens that there is a Python library that would allow you to do it. So I think you want to learn that. And then you want to make a list of whatever those things are. And we should call it something like 
computational anthropology or anthropological data science or whatever it's and it's something completely different from it doesn't come with all the uh the whole procedure of like you know it's not a, a whole thing like computer science it's something much more ad hoc and adapted to what we can do i think and I don't, I don't know what it is yet but yeah what i'm suggesting i'm not suggesting that we should learn someone else's discipline i'm suggesting that we should figure out what is it we need from within here but yeah I think that's actually a very good way to come full circle in this talk in the sense that it kind of wraps up how we are looking for, you know, using it as a method instead of, you know, this conversational other. And with that, after, um, I'm just going to grant Peter Lutz um, the honor to get the last question of this uh, talk. And then we are um, calling it a day. So Peter, please go ahead. Oh, well, thank you for that honor. Um, I certainly hope it's the beginning of continued discussions. Um, I, I, I think I have two preliminary responses to this question about how to enter the conversation, right? So I think one, one, one response is that I, I really did find the talk, the distinction between thick data and big data, that talk, I forget her name, Chen or something, um, TED Talk, if you haven't seen it, I recommend it. But I think, you know, establishing that kind of distinction, like, so we need, you know, we have all this data, but how are we going to interpret it? That's where the anthropologist can really add value. For me, the question is really how to add value if you're talking about business and clients and things like that. So I think it, starting from that point of view is, is potentially really um, fruitful. And then the question maybe is where, where do you go beyond sort of you establish that kind of like that dualism and and maybe this is where you know you're coming in with a with a, a like the next step beyond that but i think first to establish you know that to to get people to think beyond like that the big data is the 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 only answer we need right um and so once you do that then i think you really do provide the opportunity to 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 add value and then i think the other comment i had was if i haven't forgotten it i'm hope, hoping i can remember it now but um ah I think I forgot it. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, anyway, yeah, so shoot. Uh, it was a really good one. <laughs> anyway, I think that's I think that's it, yeah, for me. Well, it's the beginning of a continued conversation, right? So so we're gonna you're gonna remember the question at late at a later point. <laughs> So I want to say something in the, um, yeah, so I'm being asked to give some concluding words. I don't know if I can give concluding words, except to say, I'm super happy with all your uh, feedback, counter questions, input, like this was exactly what I was hoping for. And as you can hear, this is not, it's, I took the opportunity to ask a question that I'm not capable of answering myself. Uh, so it's been really joyful to um, to have the opportunity to discuss with, with with you, and I'm hoping we can we can keep doing that in the future. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure having you, Anders. I wish everyone a very nice Friday evening or rest of the day, uh, depending on where you're uh, calling from. And I really hope to see you soon in a, in what's going to begin to be like the very first series of Easy Digi present, presenting more art authors. And the next one is probably going to be um, what we call an FUF or a Fuck Up Friday. Um, excuse the move, by the way. <laughs> but it's going to, there's going to be more and we're really excited to start off the series. So many thanks again for attending this lecture. Anders, you were very um, inspiring today. And the rest of you, thank you for um, pitching in with, with new and fresh ideas. Enjoy your evening or the rest of the day and see you later. Thank you so much for watching or listening. And don't miss the next episode of EASA's Applied Anthropology Network's Apply Club events.